Hello everybody, my name is Brady and we are back with another React video and we're going to be continuing the Otto von Bismarck series by Extra History. We're doing part four. I'm recording this right after the previous one because I did not want to stop. I, I want to keep watching this. I, who knows how far I'm going to get on it tonight, but uh, I really enjoyed the last one. It's so much fun uh learning european history it's so fun learning new history to me uh because i've kept my area of study so narrow and i i enjoy my area of study um but it feels like it becomes increasingly narrow and uh while that is good when i'm trying to like develop kind of an expertise on very specific things uh it makes it so that stuff like this is like a whole new world to me and i i really like that so uh maybe german history prussian history like i like just this general region might be something I should uh, maybe look into, not as much for like formal study, but maybe for fun, like when, when I'm just casually reading a history book, as I do. Um, yeah, maybe. We'll see how much this inspires me. We have three more episodes, including this one, so let's get this one started. It is go time in Bismarck land. Usually they give us a little Bismarck more before the intro. List, and he was checking it twice. Action item number one on that list? Steamroll some Danes. 16 years prior, oh, no. in 1848, Prussia had invaded Denmark with the hopes of annexing the largely German-speaking duchies of Schleswig and Holstein. But the threat of international intervention had sent them packing. Now it was time for revenge, or at least a very pragmatic seizure of territory. You see, the Danish king had just cacked it, and as basically always oh. happens when a European king checks out, his death left everybody scrambling over the succession. And in this case, that scramble was played out between one staunchly Danish branch of the family and one sympathetic to the Germans. That's interesting. So it's not like a clear-cut succession here. Uh, it makes me wonder why that would be if they if they just didn't just did do you not have a kid? When the Danish group won out, they decided that it was high time to rule Schleswig and Holstein directly to finally incorporate Got any them Danish into people the in the comments. Denmark, not to leave them as semi-independent duchies with their own weird rules and privileges. This violated a treaty the Danes had signed with the Prussians, though, and gave Bismarck his chance. But it also made things tricky. After all, if Bismarck used ideas of liberating the oppressed and defending smaller nations' rights to justify invading Schleswig-Holstein, he'd have to find a really good reason for sticking around to occupy those places himself instead. Germany. Sorry, I, I keep saying Germany. We're not there yet. Sorry. Uh, but if I am speaking to people in the modern day, I guess I am speaking to Germany. So Germany... I didn't realize we had so much in common. We invade places all the time and occupying them under the guise of liberation. Like it, it turns out we have, we, I didn't know, I didn't realize we were the same country. <laughs> That's kind of funny. It's terrible, but it's funny. And defending smaller nations' rights to justify defending smaller nations' rights. Holstein, yeah, that's have to find that's on the really checklist of things we do. For sticking around <laughs> to occupy those yeah. places himself instead of just leaving again. He had been setting up these dominoes for a while, though. There would be no repeat of the last time when they had to flee due to. I hope everybody knows I'm being sarcastic. Okay, just just saying. So sometimes people don't read sarcasm on here. <laughs> Other powers coming in on the side of the Danes. He had already secured the friendship of the Russians and made vague promises to the French that they might see some territory out of the whole deal if Prussia so was we're allowed still to cool absorb Schleswig and Holstein. And without Russia or France, Britain would protest, but they'd never actually go to war on the Danish side. He had also mm. suckered in Austria, convincing them that they were all on the same side. Germans defending Germans and all that. He even convinced them to be allies and contribute a horde of troops to the effort. And this sick. is key. Not only did he need Awful, Austrian troops to secure sick. a quick victory, but it would also make them complicit. If, after they won, he Ooh. said that Prussia was going to take territory, the Austrians wouldn't walk away without their share, which... Okay, I get that. So they're, now they're in this together. And uh, one of the biggest groups that might use this 
against them, like might leverage them, might be the Austrians since we do have that tension between the two. So it's taken that off the table. I I like how he thinks. He's he's an evil genius. I really like that. Not only meant that European public opinion wouldn't turn against Prussia, but also meant that he wouldn't lose the moral high ground in the German Confederacy. And his plan worked perfectly. The combined Prussian-Austrian forces rapidly overran Denmark. The Danes had to grant the independence of Schleswig and Holstein. Bismarck made some ludicrous demands, and the Austrians, not wanting to be left out, eventually caved to a compromise that left Bismarck exactly where he actually wanted to be. Prussia would keep Schleswig, the Austrians would get Holstein, and he would get a small pile of other minor concessions to boot. But Bismarck was always a man of large appetites. He didn't come all this way to only get Schleswig. And so, part two of the plan commenced. Operation Make Fun of Austrian Incompetence. He played up everything that went wrong in Holstein, and talked openly about it being a breeding ground for revolutionaries. His sound and fury brought the two nations to the brink of war, but both of their monarchs wanted to avoid such a conflict between brothers. Wilhelm accepted the possibility of war, but forbade Bismarck from explicitly goading the Austrians anymore. But Bismarck's work on that front was already done. He had a backup plan in case war didn't come. Bismarck always had a backup plan, but he spent most of his time trying to shore up alliances. So I feel like I don't have a good grasp of the, uh, the military power of both sides. Uh, clearly, the Prussians have a powerful military, and they have because they feel the need to uh, maintain it, and it's such a threat to power if they don't maintain it well. Uh, I feel like I haven't gotten the same degree of detail on the Austrian side, but from what I can tell from the emphasis that they put on the Prussian military and from kind of uh, Bismarck's... Uh, arrogance going into this i feel like he has good reason to believe he could win in a military conflict that's that's what i'm getting so far to make sure that prussia was ready for the fight his king sort of didn't want first the italians victor emmanuel the man trying to unify italy desperately wanted to take over venice which was in austrian hands i mean how can you have an italy with no venice but he was never going to have the strength to fight Austria alone, and so Bismarck seized on this, getting him to agree that if Prussia and Austria went to war, the newly formed Italian kingdom would join in for only the small, small price of one Venice, which Bismarck didn't really want anyway. Next, the French. Hmm. While not publicly successful in securing the French as allies, Bismarck was dealing with Napoleon III here, a man too clever for his own good by half. Napoleon III, mm. who saw himself as the equal of his famous uncle, but really, really wasn't, took the only... I, I know the first Napoleon. I know, I know Napoleon Bonaparte, but I don't know this Napoleon nearly as well. Like, I have a little knowledge of some stuff uh, that went on on the U.S. side of things and how we culturally reacted to conflict in Europe when Napoleon III was hanging around or whatever. But uh, yeah, I, I would say he's another person who I'm not as familiar with as I would like. Course of action that would get him nothing. He wouldn't support Prussia, but he wouldn't support Austria either. This was just fine by Bismarck. Finally, Bismarck kept pressure well, I'm on glad Austria, he's happy. having Prussian officials meet with Romanians and Magyars, Czechs and Serbs, any ethnic minority within the Austrian Empire, all in order to make it look like he was building allies and raising legions of revolutionaries ready to revolt the moment the Austrians went to war. But Bismarck's plans were interrupted by one thing he did not factor in. As he walked down the great boulevard Unter den Linden, two shots broke the quiet. He oh whirls. no. A young man stands before him, revolver in hand. The 51-year-old Bismarck grabs him. Three more shots ring oh, out as dude. they grapple. Finally, soldiers run up and subdue the young He's man. He's definitely hit, as right? As the assassin is hauled off, they check Bismarck for wounds. One finds a hole in his coat and follows it to find a hole in his waistcoat, which, with some trepidation, he follows to find a hole in Bismarck's shirt. All five shots had hit. But every oh. one of them had either only grazed him or bounced off of his ribs. It 
It's kind of insane. I've heard all sorts of situations like this where people take like a ton of fire and you would think that you'd know if you've been shot, but like I, I've seen so many situations where people have so much trouble determining if they are shot. And like, that's so hard for me to understand, like even abstractly, uh, because when I look at it, it's just like, okay, you should, cl you should probably know that you've been shot and you should probably be able to tell me exactly where it is. Uh, but apparently that's a thing and I don't fully understand why. But every one of them had either only grazed him or bounced off of his ribs. In a moment that history Sick. doesn't record, but I think we all know happened, Bismarck simply nodded to the soldier, said, Iron Chancellor, put on paint, <laughs> and walked away. Refusing to let one measly assassination attempt get in the way of a good war, Bismarck went right back to work getting the German-speaking world to tear itself apart. And as rumors swirled, the Austrians felt they had to make a move. So they called the Pan-German Diet in Frankfurt to decide the issue of Schleswig and Holstein. The Diet moved against Prussia, but this played right into Bismarck's hand. The moment the Diet came to their decision, the Prussian representative read a statement that Bismarck had prepared for just such a moment, declaring the Diet invalid and the German Confederation dissolved. Now it would be war. It would be the northern German states and Prussia against the southern German states and the Austrian Empire. Hundreds of thousands of men were mustered. It could have been a long war, but now the king had in his service a general as capable on the battlefield as Bismarck was in the conference room, General Moltke. The uncle of the General Moltke who will so disastrously lead the German forces into the First World War, this... Okay, I was about to say, I think I know that name. I think I've heard of that, but I think I know the younger. I, I, and not even well. It's just one of those names I think I've heard before. Smoltke could not have been more different from his nephew. He was one of the first to see that the modern rifle had made the idea of the frontal charge obsolete. He grasped the importance mm. of railroads for mobilization and realized that modern armies were too big to be commanded by one man, that plans should be flexible and subordinates should be allowed to take initiative within them. It was this Moltke who famously said, That's clever. Plans never survive contact with the enemy. Moltke led a lightning war. I like this. I, I like learning about this because uh, even after this guy, it seems there are a lot of people who... Uh, are still a little bit behind in their military tactics. So it's nice to see that that's not necessarily universal. We have somebody like this who is trying to move things forward a little bit and acknowledge that times are a-changing and uh, it's time to uh, incorporate some new tactics and change the way that we structure things based on the fact that technology changes, uh, the sizes of armies change, like everything's different. Why should we run things the same way we did back in uh, the beginning of the century? Or crushing the once great Austrian empire within weeks. And now where Bismarck had once had to work so hard to get the king to go to war, their success had been so great that he had to work equally hard to get the king to stop. Bismarck oh, realized no. that they could only push so far before the other great powers stepped in and all of the work that he had done would be undone. More still, he believed that once he had eclipsed them, he might need the Austrians to serve as a balance against one of the other great powers. So he must not impose on them a peace that would leave them hating Prussia. So Bismarck called in his erstwhile enemy, the crown prince, the same Frederick Wilhelm who he had so unsuccessfully tried to put on the throne as a toddler, and put him to work reigning in his father. Fritz, a lover of peace despite being an excellent military commander, convinced the king to accept the deal that Bismarck had on the table. Prussia would take right. over most of northern Germany. The German Confederation as a body would be disbanded. Their Italian allies would get Venice, and Austria would forever be banned from any pan-German parliament or from meddling in German affairs. Oh, and weirdly, Liechtenstein became an independent country, so that also. Hmm. All in all, things were looking up for Bismarck. I didn't even think about how that worked into this. That's actually really interesting. Prussian rule. There just loomed. One but how could we just skipped over that? Like, how could we just like skim over that? Like, that feels like it's a huge thing. I mean, the people who live there—that's probably huge for them. That's like that's probably a whole. They could do a whole series on that in itself. I'm sure. Like. Um, that, that lovely country that I struggled to pronounce. 
One more obstacle. One great nation that, although neutral so far, would oppose any further increase in German unity and strength. There was the problem of France. The problem of France. I feel like uh, we bring that up a lot in the in the 19th century. <laughs> the problem of France. Um, and a little late, a good amount in the 18th century as well. France, uh, they are where the drama be during this time. Like, I mean, it just seems like it never stops. Um, we got to do some stuff on French history on here. That That is something I feel like I've not done enough of. I think... Sorry, I just I think I think I've just acquired the hiccups. Um, glad it's at the end of the video. Um, yeah, I, I think we we've got to find some more French history. So yeah, I I'm enjoying the series so far, and I don't think I see myself slowing down. I think I'm gonna wrap this up over the next couple of days. Uh, of course, I will have other videos out as well, so that you're not just getting extra history stuff. So, but th so there will be some double uploads every once in a while here. Uh, but I want to keep these going. I, I might make extra history more of a daily thing going forward if the series end, if they keep being this good. Um, but I th I'm pretty sure that this one is like exceptional among the rest, uh, considering. Uh, how much demand there was for it. So, thank you for watching. I'm really excited to get into the next one, and I will see you guys then. See you tomorrow. All right, bye.